Welcome into the Art Gibbs Sports Business Podcast. This is episode 17. In this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about the Green Bay Packers, their unique ownership structure, and what exactly it means. All right, so welcome in. And First things first, one thing I want to say, and you won't see this if you're listening, but right here we have a question. This is something that we may try to do more often. This question, uh, for those listening, is who first popularized EBITDA? Now, EBITDA, of course, is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And this is a very common non-GAAP kind of measure that, that companies use and that people report. Uh, Anyway, so the question is, who first popularized the use of EBITDA? You can comment below, and we may, we're going to try to start to do a little more interactive stuff like this, and if, if it, if it works, you know, then we'll, we'll kind of continue, but this, this is the first question. Um, If you know, comment below, that'd be fantastic. I'll give you a hint. It's someone that has been mentioned on, on our previous podcasts. So if you've seen the previous podcasts, or heard the previous podcast, maybe it was a guest, maybe it was someone referenced, uh, but it this person is in those previous podcasts. So uh, whoever first popularized the use of EBITDA is in those first podcasts. You can go back and look and listen to kind of have your uh, array of choices, or if you know, uh, that's fantastic, and you can just comment below. So that's the first question. Who first popularized EBITDA? So... In this episode, what I wanted to do is take a quick look at the Green Bay Packers. Now, the Green Bay Packers, everyone knows, is a very unique ownership structure. It's uh, Many people are shareholders in the Green Bay Packers. You may know a friend or family who's a shareholder in, in the Green Bay Packers. You know, someone uh, who's a big fan uh, potentially is a, is a shareholder, could be a shareholder in the Green Bay Packers. And... It's kind of an interesting thing because we always hear about team ownership, we, especially in the NFL. We hear about the value that these teams have. We hear about uh, roster depreciation allowance, like in a, a previous episode uh, that we have on this podcast. If you're interested in what that is, you can go back. It's 30 minutes just on that to, and kind of talks about the history of it and some ways that it was used and, and that kind of stuff. But we always hear about NFL teams. We hear about the Dodgers. We hear about soccer teams. We hear about these teams where – the value is very high. There's tremendous growth in the in the in the value of the the asset, this team, and many times uh, there's also cash spit off each year, pretty significant cash spit off each year. So that's a great thing to own, something that spits off a good amount of cash and appreciates, you know, well beyond inflation um, from a, from a basic uh, perspective, and something that doesn't require a lot of capital consistently going into it. Beyond what is what is earned by the business, uh, generated by the business itself, so the business is able to generate money and and pay for maintenance and that kind of stuff. Every once in a while, there's large capital expenditures, and certainly losses can be run. But generally, it's it's viewed that uh, in these popular leagues, uh, ownership of a team is is profitable. is is a good thing. Uh, but what we see with the Green Bay Packers, obviously, is that you know your aunt Nancy and your brother John own the Green Bay Packers. And we know, we all sort of know uh, intuitively that it's not quite like owning uh, traditional equity. But but what does that really mean? So we did a little work just to kind of break that out a little bit and give some details on how that works, how how it actually works. So the Green Bay Packers, you know, they're they're an old, very popular franchise in the NFL. They're in the smallest city in the NFL. They're in the smallest market in the NFL. Their city has about 100,000 people, 150,000 people. The um, TV audience is about 600,000 people, and that really pales in comparison to any other any other markets in the NFL. That really pales in comparison. Uh, but the teams remain there. The team's very popular. And one of the reasons the team has remained there is based on uh, its current its its ownership structure, basically. So there are a lot of shareholders in the Green Bay Packers. Like I said, many people own own these shares. These shares can vote, and beyond that, you know, that's kind of where their comparison to traditional traditional equity goes away. 
So they can vote, but they aren't actually a claim on equity within the Green Bay Packers. They don't pay a dividend, and there's no market or ability to really transfer them. Now, you can transfer them. There's some some tight constraints around transferring them to you know your uh, a family member or, or that kind of thing, and you can gift them. But uh, no one can own more than 4% of, of the Green Bay Packers. There's, and they, the shares really, the shares can only be sold back to the team. And the shares, and, and when they're sold back to the team, they're sold at a, at a steep discount to what they were purchased, a, agreed upon steep discount. So it's not like something where, you know, you could get the shares appraised and, you know, they represent some percentage of equity, you get the shares appraised, and then, you know, maybe the the organization uh, is the only buyer, but they would have to pay based on this appraisal, uh, something like that, that does not occur. And and like I said, again, the equity stake, it's it, it actually has no equity stake. Uh, something that kind of goes without saying, but that's an interesting point is, uh, of course, this is a grandfathered in ownership structure. Or what, l- hold on, let's go back a little bit. Let's talk a little more about the ownership structure ship structure again. Okay, so so there is a board of directors. There is um it is a nonprofit. They do release a balance sheet every year. Um and originally the so originally in the articles of incorporation that were enacted in 1923, uh, they specified that uh, should the franchise be sold uh, any post expenses, so basically any profit retained earnings, would have to would have to go to the Sullivan Whalen Post of the American Legion uh, to build quote a proper soldier's memorial, um, and this was done as kind of a financial stipulation that would prevent that would kind of prevent the owners from wanting to really move the franchise because any profits would would go right back into that. Now they've since changed that and the profits go to the Green Bay Packers Foundation and they do some charity work and you know so that's kind of the setup. So the the money, the any profits all of that money is controlled by this nonprofit and then the any profits that you know beyond expenses that this nonprofit has that would go to this Green Bay Packers Foundation. Now, of course, this ownership structure is grandfathered in. It's not currently allowed. Uh, as we discussed on a previous uh, podcast, I, th- I believe it was on that Rawsuit Appreciation Allowance podcast, we discussed the 30% ownership threshold. So there's a 30% ownership threshold that a single owner must have uh, in, in the... Uh, NFL team and that that allows for the NFL to have basically a uh, since the the owners of the teams represent the league uh, it allows each team to have a representative to the league have a singular voice um, and that kind of stuff and there each team can only have 32 owners with you know within that team uh, minority owners so in Green Bay's case they have in 2014, they had over 370,000, or 300. They had over 360,000 shareholders in uh, 2014. So that that would not, uh, you know, pass. And and again, we we talked about that 30% ownership structure. We talked about it in in terms of when debt could be used. So in that episode, we were talking about leverage and sort of these leveraged uh, tax benefits. And of course, in in that case, the leverage that that would be used, or that the NFL would loan to a potential buyer, would start after that thirty percent ownership kicked in. So, or after that thirty percent ownership, so the the buyer would have to come up with that thirty percent. Then, some level beyond that, the NFL would offer that you know ability to finance. So, in this case, clearly it it's a grandfathered in structure. It, the structure, the the main sort of result of it is that it that it basically keeps the Green Bay Packers in Green Bay. So of course, even though it's a nonprofit, and even though these these profits are sweeped, it's still a very big organization. It still gets its claim on this, you know, the five billion dollar 
uh, deal that the that the NFL has with you know for their TV contract. So it still gets that piece. It obviously still has big big gate revenue. Uh, it has a you know museum revenue, all of that kind of stuff. Merchandising is is very big for them. So there's a, there's a lot of money there, and there's a lot of money that's controlled. And of course, even within a nonprofit, there's you know, controlling that money is a big, is a very big deal. So the way it's set up is there's a seven member, is there's a seven member executive committee, and that com- that committee is elected from a 45 member uh, board of directors. Um, it consists of a president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, three members at large, and only the president is compensated. Yeah, so only the president is compensated, and the president is the one who represents. Uh, the Green Bay Packers at the NFL owners' meetings. So a couple other interesting points. Um, the the current sort of nonprofit structure was started in 1923. It was done, um, you know, as kind of the, the the Packers were in financial difficulty, and uh, let's see, according to their website, A. B. Turnbull told Lambeau and George Calhoun to play their games, and he bailed them out of debt. And he organized local investors and turned turned the uh, team into a, a nonprofit. One of the one of the factors that they say sort of helped build the Packers over time is they played up until 1995 three of their regular season games in Milwaukee, which exposed them to that market. As far as the stock raises, there was uh, several done. Um, Again, it's uh, you could say it's a traditional equity capital raise, but there's no equity given. There was uh, the first the first sale in 1923 to get it going. Uh, there was one in, in 1935 that raised fifteen thousand um, dollars to kind of you know bail the bail the bail the company out. A third in 1950 after Lambeau's 30 year domination. That that one went very well. People really wanted to buy the shares. Um, and then the fourth came in uh, late 97, 98, and that added uh, 105,000 shareholders and raised more than $23 million. And the money was used to do a redevelopment product pro- uh, project at Lambeau Field. And then the uh, fifth and final capital raise came in in the end of 2011, and that raised uh, $64 million. Uh, and just an interesting note on the founding of the Green Bay Packers, this is a an idea that we'll get into a little bit on um, an upcoming podcast. We've got a, a really special guest on the upcoming podcast, um, an author who's who's written um, a lot on some of this kind of stuff about the development of sport. But you know, sport originally was very communal, um, very based on working environments. Uh, people that worked in the shipyard might play. People that worked at another shipyard and that kind of thing. And it was kind of a blue collar pastime. And you know, with the Green Bay Packers, it was a uh, you know it was actually uh, purchased by the Indian packing company, which is a meat packing company. And it was, uh, you know, a team that was up there that, that played football. They purchased the team and, and they were a meat packing company and then they were absorbed by Acme Packing Company. So again, that's that's kind of a little bit about about the Green Bay Packers, about the, the way that it works. Uh, generally, it's a nonprofit. The shareholders, the benefits that they have, they can vote uh, and they can engage in purchasing certain, uh, you know, shareholder only items and and that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's a very interesting situation that one of the most well known teams, if not the the most well known team in the NFL, is is set up very differently and and has a, a long extensive history and uh, a feeling of community support. Like I said, again, they they have basically the same sort of ins and outs, uh, roughly that other that other uh, franchises would uh, or do. Uh, of course, their local game day revenue varies, but that varies across all teams uh, from you know a variety of factors. This. Green Bay team, they, they have to contribute to the fund for the you know concussion uh, lawsuit settlements, and they uh, receive the TV money and, and all of that kind of stuff. But again, they've got these these shares. They're set up in a nonprofit manner. The shares don't represent equity. They don't pay a dividend. They do vote, uh, and the shareholders are also allowed to attend the annual shareholder meeting. Um, 
that occurs. All right, so that's a little on the Green Bay Packers, and uh, we hope you enjoyed that. Again, answer this question below or uh, on our uh, leave a review on the, the podcast. But again, who first popularized EBITDA is the question. So we'll look to see if anybody's got that answer. Again, a hint, uh, this person was either a guest on or, or talked about in one of our previous podcasts. So again, we're in the early stages. Anything, I'll say it again, anything like like, subscribe, five-star rating, fantastic. That, that will really help us out a lot. Uh, thank you, and uh, we'll see you next time.